And now it's my pleasure to introduce three amazing and wonderful media scholars uh, whom I've invited to be interlocutors for Professor Wanzo this evening. The interlocutors will kick off the Q&A portion of this event by asking questions of their own, uh, of our fantastic speaker. And after Professor Wanzo has had the opportunity to engage with the interlocutors for about 15 or 20 or 25 minutes, I'll start posing questions suggested by you, the audience. So please post your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. Our interlocutors tonight are Grace Gibson, Patrick Johnson, and Malika Imhotep. Grace D. Gibson is an assistant professor in the Department of African American Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. Before joining the Department of African American Studies at VCU in 2020, she served as a Frederick Douglass Institute or FDI uh, for, African American, for African and African American Studies postdoctoral fellow at the University of Rochester and as a visiting lecturer at Georgia State University. Dr. Gibson is a Black future feminist slash pop culture scholar whose research explores Black popular culture, digital humanities, representations of race and gender within comic books, Afrofuturism, and race and new media. Her current book project seeks to explore Black female identities as personified in comics and fandom culture. Patrick Johnson is an assistant professor of American Multicultural Studies at Sonoma State University. His work has been published in the Review of Research and Education, Ethnic Studies Review, and the edited collections Culturally Sustaining Pedagogy, Teaching and Learning for Justice in a Changing World, and We Dare Say Love, Supporting African American Male Achievement. His research interests include television studies, Black fan studies, cultural memory, and the residual circulation of past Black media. Ra Malaika Imhotep is a Black feminist writer and performance artist from Atlanta, Georgia, currently pursuing a doctoral degree in African diaspora studies at the University of California, Berkeley, with a designated emphasis in new media. Her academic and creative work tends the relationships between Black femininity, Southern vernacular aesthetics, and the performance of labor. They are a co-convener of the embodied spiritual political education project, the Church of Black Feminist Thought, and a member of the curatorial collective, The Black Aesthetic. And I am the captain of the fandoms of all three of these stellar researchers. Uh, let's start with you, Grace. Can you um, kick off with a question for our brilliant speaker? Yes, um, thank you, uh, Professor Wanza, also for um, an, an amazing talk. Um, I was definitely sitting here in awe, like, wow, okay, what, what do I say? What do I ask? So thank you for, um, for sharing that. So I'm, I'm thinking about, so you, you used the case study of Watchmen, and I'm also thinking about Lovecraft Country um, in the way of, do you feel as maybe there is, um, so both have texts that are written by white male authors, um, and then also, do you see maybe, is there an ease of comfort with the way that Lovecraft, um, Lovecraft Country's depiction of the Tulsa massacre um, in comparison to the way that Watchmen um, uses it? And because Lovecraft Country centers blackness, you know, pretty much throughout the show and whereas Watchmen, it, it's kind of part of the show. Um, do you think maybe Lovecraft Country gets a certain level of currency, kind of what you were speaking to, uh, versus maybe what Watchmen does not? So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I was on with, again, another panelist, uh, Andre Carrington, uh, University of Tulsa, a, a couple months ago. And uh, Lovecraft Country came up. It was about Watchmen, the panel, but Lovecraft Country came up in the chat and the conversation. And there's been some discussion because it's a Black creator um, about, I think, the sort of the different kind of work or ways that they're they're doing it. Um, I don't actually know that I would say that um, Lovecraft Country centers Blackness more. Um, I think it's, it's um, Lovecraft Country, I think, runs through a broader range of things in relation to Black history. It sort of, it runs through all the things, I would say almost, right? Um, so it's telling multiple narratives. That's the structure of the story um, and does have a black showrunner. Um, but I do, and I think that, I think part of what I wanna push against is the idea that I've heard a few people say like, a Watchmen's read this way because it's a white person who did it when you know people are just erasing the, the diversity of the writing room. Um, versus the Black showrunners, the Black showrunner, and that's why that hasn't been renewed automatically. I think we sort of moved to that really quickly. Um, 
And I, you know, I think that Tulsa episode was one of the the better episodes of the series. You know, I was saying before we all talked that I found that show uneven and there were some episodes that I thought were just exquisite. And then some that I thought were, you know, a little shaky. Um, And I think, but ease is an interesting thing because I think it's always hard and challenging about how do you depict black suffering. And I think that there's a, a hermeneutic that people use automatically in trying to read it that, that is sometimes overdetermined by what they imagine intent is or how they're reading identity. And I just wanna think about or push against that and trying to figure out the, the relation between this as being a collective part of US history that everyone must grapple with, that we all should own right? It's all, it's, it's property for all of us, but there's a specific specificity to injury and property for say black people. And then there's a specificity for people in Tulsa, right? And so we're negotiating all of those things. Excellent. All right, Patrick, can we have a question from you, please? Yes, I was really interested in particularly the moral rights claims. And I was curious how you might put that in conversation. You touched on it a little bit about our Black music, particularly like in hip hop, but it's thinking about, for example, like certain artists not allowing their music to be sampled because of what they thought the end result was going to be. So I'm just curious about how this idea might also be in conversation with some of the examples that we've seen historically within uh, Black music. Think about Tracy Chapman and Nikki. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm forever a Tracy Chapman fan. I mean, and, and so that is an interesting question. Like sampling is so essential to a black music tradition. And then when you take a piece, you sample, like, let's say, can we imagine fair use? You know, what does it mean to take it, right? Um, you know, I, I'm, I make very clear that I am not a music scholar, but it's hard to think about this issue without thinking about music. Um, again, the, the long held histories of actual theft. Um, but I mean, I, you know, and I, so I don't know where, cause I, I think I have a different position on it or my relation to it is, is different than some people who really are embedded in thinking about music cultures and the remix culture as part of black music as inherently. So, and black people, I think have an interesting space in this. They are both the people who are stolen from in terms of music the most. And then there's a space where they have a remix culture, like what is some reggae or hip hop, there's certain forms of music production without dance hall culture without remix. So um, they're, they're both the primary victims and primary participants um, in um, thinking about music use without um, total ownership, right? Um, so, I mean, I guess it's, it's this issue of citational practice, like, can we imagine like a sample is always good? And it's, I feel, I mean, the interesting thing is, I think that we will support the sampling when we believe in the ethical, the rights, or we like, we, you know, we support hip hop, we think that we recognize this part of the culture, but I feel like if some white supremacist group wanted to sample something, we'd be like, they can't do that. That's our right, right? So, I mean, I just think we have to sort of start to be honest about like the kinds of moral claims we're making that may not always be consistent. Um, and what, you know, what do we do with inconsistency in our theoretical formulations? Wow, I feel like we could talk for at least four more hours just about that last response you gave. Uh, but I'm gonna turn it over to Malika. Malika, thank you. Thank you, Grace, and thank you, Patrick. And let's hear from Malika. Wow, I have so many thoughts <laughs> running through my head right now. And so I'm like, okay, look at the paper, ask the question. Um, but this has been so rich and the questions from um, my co-interlocutors have, have just added to the richness. Um, a lot of my work is an attempt to do something different, which I, I really feel you pointing, pointing us to, Dr. Wanzo, about like the, the discourse of appropriation, even the discourse of the certain types of like um, injury that are always already read onto representations of um, Black feminine figures. Um, and I'm just, I guess I'm curious about the example that's coming into my head right now is the Viola Davis. I want to say it was a Vanity Fair cover. Um, and she's in this beautiful dress sitting on a stool. Her back is exposed. 
And um, I initially encountered the image as just a striking image of beautiful Viola Davis. Um, and then uh, it came that it was supposedly this represent or this homage or this citation of, um, wow, my like my black studies facts are slipping, but th there's this famous in image of a black male slave with with uh, welts on his Gordon, black. Gordon technically, and it's in the, and actually it turned out his name wasn't Gordon, but in Harper's, yes. Right, exactly. So it's not even just my, it's like my citational brain is scrambled because the citation is scrambled. Um, but I guess I'm just curious about and thinking out loud about like what, and that's probably not a good example because that photographer was attempting to represent injury in a way. Um, but I guess I'm curious about at what point does like a beautiful black femme back get to just be a beautiful black femme back mm -hmm. or if it does, <laughs> you know, and just kind of, I know that's not a specific question, but I'm so curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, and I was trying to remember, I, like I vaguely remember when it happened. I mean, I knew because of the Gordon piece and I was just teaching it a couple of weeks ago. I teach about it every year. Um, so that's always the edge of my memory, but I hadn't remembered that that was what was going on. And was did they remind me? Did they say specifically it was it was referencing that, or did people say that it evoked that? So I'm trying. I'm scrambling now to find it, but I do think I think that there was initial like, is this like there was initial like black Twitter chatter? But I and I think that the photographer did say something that people might call like fake deep. Um, about like what he was trying to do with that. Mm -hmm. So the photographer says he did. That's interesting because I do, and I've argued elsewhere that there's um, something called uh, that, that I think that there's I've called like a just syntax that there's a, a tendency to sort of reduce representations of of black people to stereotype. Um, and sort of known representations because that is sort of the limited vocabulary we have in terms of seeing blackness, that blackness going back to the point about um, the limits of individuality and sort of histories of black representation. Um, um, but I do, I think it's hard for black people to just, to, for a black person to just be a black person. And that is not only a structure, I won't say it's not only a structure imposed by white supremacy, I think that as we know, in terms of, of um, black thoughts, black cultural production uh, in the West, in the diaspora, broadly speaking, we are always responding to, right? And there, it, it constructs these sort of limitations in relationship to, to how um, interpretation occurs. Um, and so, it, I think it's very hard for um, a beautiful black woman's black to just be a beautiful black woman's black. Like that, that, that we're read always in relation to other representations. I, I do think that's often the case, right? Um, to go back to the issue of property or sort of ownership, like there is a privilege in being able to be like a liberal, an unfettered subject conceptually, right? Great, thank you so much. Um, I would love to hear maybe one more question from each of you uh, in any order. Who who has something, you know, to just make this more of a conversation, who wants to jump in at this point? One question I did have is about reception. And so, I appreciated your references. I uh, was thinking about uh, Dr. Gates' work, particularly around coming to America and Dr. Martin's work about the whiz and these ways that these texts that were written by like white folks end up being taken up as black texts. And then it also made me think about the idea of whiteness as property, right? And so here's my question is, in what ways could we argue or maybe think about the investment in keeping Watchmen a white text that some folks had uh, and again, it, and, and at what moment does the text become racialized through a reception, regardless of whatever we're thinking about in the construction of the text? And so that, if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah, no, and, and it's funny because I, I actually sent uh, Raquel the um, appropriation section. I was, like, I was like, girl, this is going to get me in trouble. I was like, what do you think? And she's like, well, I think... <laughs> She's like, I think you need to say 
more about black reception. So, and I just didn't, I was, I was already over in terms of my link. And so I, I did not say more, but yes, um, black reception practices is part of what can sort of make things black and that, that reception practices are also part of like can make things white, right? And that we have, um, and that white people have sort of this power in, um, it's, it's another, cause I actually, there's part of this, I was, I went back to Cheryl Harris's whiteness is property for this paper. Um, and it's not, you know, I didn't spend much time cause I could just spend a huge amount of time trying to think about property um, and history. But I mean, I think the longer version will have more of that in it because, um, there is something that we have to think about how ownership is working um, in fan culture and with narrative and history and how these things intersect, um, but are also not the same, um, that have real material impact. It has economic impact, um, psychological impact. Like it's another way to think about whiteness as property that I don't know that I've seen people think about somewhere. And please, someone in the chat or the q and if someone has some references for me, I would love to have them. But I'm, but I just, now that I've started thinking through this, I think we do need to have to think about like effective economies of property and consumption and, and how that is um, structuring a lot of the struggle when we're having these debates and um, fights with people about what we can do with certain kinds of intellectual properties. To kind of like add a little bit onto what Patrick was also asking, and you, you kind of talked about this earlier too, like so do black people really have like true, like full ownership of, their, of the text that we're calling black cultural text? You know, um, are we saying somebody like maybe Ava DuVernay who has her own production company who, you know, but maybe it's under still a larger umbrella that's not black. Like, do we really have something that is truly a black cultural text that is truly, you know, fully, you know, black ownership? Well, I mean, and I was, and I was just, you know, talking to my students about this today. We're reading Sadia Hartman's Where It Lies, but, um, and I also been referencing this in, in my paper. I just like full ownership, um, full agency is, is something we we have to be leery of, I think, in terms of how it, um, I think it's kind of, in, it can be injurious. It's another form of injury to black people because if, 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 if the only way we can understand agency and power for black people is that we are fully empowered, we lose something in terms of recognizing um, black subjectivity. Um, and then, you know, I think Kristen Warner, I mean, she's someone who would like make a case, she has this whole thing, like it takes a white man in terms of things of like um, Brad Pitt and his plan B and the production company and how, you know, that he's, he's enabling these black creators to do things like the presumption that full ownership always produces products that um, enable more things for black people is something we also need to be careful of too, right? Um, what is like, um, you know, no one is like fully free, like conceptually, right? I mean, it, just in terms of a general social contract theory way of understanding the world. So, but there are obviously people who have a lot more freedom than others. And we also know that black creators have a lot less opportunity to create than others or to produce or to own production companies. These are empirical realities. Um, but I mean, I think this question of what ownership necessarily enables. I mean, I think that Black Panther is an interesting example. I mean, people are like, it's peak blackness. It's the blackity black. It's the blackest thing ever. And there is absolutely, and, and then some people disagree with that, but there are a number of people who do really believe that. And there is nothing more corporate than Disney, Marvel, superhero, MCU. That is the most white corporate owned thing one can possibly imagine in Hollywood. And people embrace that like that was the blackest thing they'd ever seen. So maybe we have varying degrees of what ownership means. Like, so we, we shouldn't rely on like one idea of like what ownership is. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in on that point um, or question? Because I think I heard you, Rebecca, um, propose or sort of postulate um, that there's a 
there's a way we can look to reggae or something like dub music and and sort of like derive a theory of ownership where there isn't ever full ownership. I just wanted to, I heard you like hint at that or say that quickly towards the end of your talk. And I just wanted to sort of like tease that out more. Or I think like in the answer, I said that, how do we understand something that's so fundamentally shaped by things like remix culture as um, if, if, we, if we want to sort of put limits on use and sampling, et cetera, then, you know, what happens to um, these things are so foundational to black cultural production is something that is, a, you know, foundational remix. And many music scholars have talked about this um, in, in ways that are, you know, much more fluent and thoughtful than I could. Um, but in general, just thinking about the continuum of intellectual property rights law and this relation between the, the difference between the thing itself and expression. Um, I think black folks, again, they're, they're, they're both the primary victims and the primary, um, the, and also one of the primary practitioners of expression. I mean, if we think of, um, it's interesting to think about someone like Nina Simone, who like we, we know for women and some of the stuff she's written most, but she's also was a profound reinterpreter of music. She took mm -hmm. music and made it completely her own. Jazz does this. There are all kinds of examples where expression, even if they weren't originally creators of things, like feeling good, like who knows that, what was it called? The Roar of Grease Paint, whatever that music came from. Like who knows that musical? Nobody knows that musical. Nobody knows, cares about anybody who sang feeling good before Nina Simone, nor should they, honestly. Um, and so it's expression is, um, it's, I do believe I, I sort of that makes sense to me in terms of the law that expression is the thing, right? Um, but I mean, there there are obviously complications with it, and I and I and I do see how we have some competing rights that we may not be able to sort of arrive at transparently ethical solutions to. Hey, yay! This is so exciting, um, and like I'm geeking out because literally at the place we've just arrived like is at the coordinates of a little section of the notes I was writing when you were talking. So I'm like, yes. Um, I'm thinking a lot about kind of where Patrick started with his question around um, black love objects. And I, I like, I've long been curious about when this issue was raised by like, oh, such and such had a white writer, da, 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 da. Like is what takes root in the black effective commodity the script that or the thing that the white man pitched or is it the reinterpretation of the black talent that enlivened said mm -hmm. thing and so I guess I'm really curious about like I understand the stakes of the conversation around ownership as you've like um, laid out for us but I'm wondering about like what are what might be the kind of like what if it's not about recuperating different forms of of minor ownership but like what like what might be the space where like we're thinking about black black cultural exchange and like black cultural transfer and all those things without like trying to feed it back into the the thing around property and i know it's not i feel like all my questions are just like mostly excited <laughs> rambles <laughs> but yeah well, and I'll go there with you. I mean, I guess, well, here's my question back to you. Is what we're looking for is a single space or what we're imagining multiple spaces? And then with the recuperation, when you were talking, I was thinking about all these fights people are having about soul. Like there's just all kinds of like struggle on my Facebook feed about that movie, right? So there's some people like, it's like C and it's like it loses the, the white woman's in the body and menstrual C and some people like, I loved it. You know, I found this meaningful. And then supposed to see the black man came in later. The black man didn't create it. And so then they had to fix it. And so there's just all these, the, the, again, in terms of thinking about reception, we don't have homogenous reception. And what's also often problematic is when we theorize, and I have also been guilty of this. Like I, I have a version of something I've never put out that at some point I need to finish about the help. Like I have some issues and lots of black women I know have issues, but there are also black women who do not. They have different kinds of relation to how to, to read or interpret that film and enjoy that film. And um, 
I think to your question about what space we have, I think what we have to recognize in terms of the diversity of Black audiences is there are people who need all kinds of spaces. There's some people who really need that MCU space, right? And there's some people who really need some kind of Black network space that's not BET, right? Like there's some people who need some kind of other space that is Black owned and um, doing something else. And there's some people who need some kind of Black space that can do things like random acts of flyness, mm -hmm. right? Which is outside of a whole bunch of people's Black imaginary, but like in some people like, ooh, I didn't know we could have like Black stuff like this on TV. So, I mean, I think there's just, we need multiple spaces. I mean, that was what my answer would be. Yeah, that's great. And I, I just add that off like that, and I've thought about this in relationship to Twitter, but I think it applies here too, that oftentimes the need for multiple, for all of those spaces can be expressed in the, or felt by the, uh, the singular black subject, if that's even a thing, you know? Like perhaps yeah. we're all <laughs> multiverses in and of ourselves and we all need all the different types of things and all have mixed feelings about the things as we engage them oh yeah I need all those spaces but I need all those things but I I consume I consume all the things um awesome I feel like I see Patrick with a thought well yeah I, mean, I guess I was thinking about like sometimes I think these conversations also come down to like did I like it or not and then like, does it do something for me on this level? And then once it, it does whatever it does, then the conversation is like, okay, is it doing all these other things? But I think that this, there's somebody who like really needed soul and that soul did something for them. And it's somebody who's like, okay, it didn't do those things. So now I also can go in on it. And I think about like Bell Hooks' work when she's talking particularly about um, people's different reception to like Amos and Andy. And that these women, we were looking at like the, the Sapphire character. It's like there were younger women who like were really not with it, but uh, older women who were like, no, I, I, I see something in this character. And so I think the, the issue on sometimes is like, that's why reception for me becomes really important because I guess my, my question, the way I keep thinking about it is at what moment, the, almost do I care if the person, what the origin is, if like I am able to make this black in my own individual life and in my own individual communities, does it matter like what, what the origin was? Because the other thing that we have too is black folks who produce things that don't rock, that a lot of black people don't rock with. And then th those folks still need to be able to produce uh, material. I mean, there's a lot more probably white folks out there who rock with moonlight in some ways than like black folks. If we're to be like in, in our own like everyday experiences for a lot of us, it's like, so what does that mean? As mm -hmm. so the reception to me does have to be kind of at least part of the conversation, even in these things about ownership. Like we own coming to America in a certain way, like regardless, like you ain't gonna tell us nothing about coming to America. Like I don't care, I didn't I don't care who did this, or like I don't care there's a whole bunch of white kids singing I'm black and I'm proud on the hook of I'm black and I'm proud, that it still does something for me from a effective level. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, um, I think though that the challenge for us though is that, um, is that there is an intellectual habit. I mean, you know, what do we do with the relation between individual or sort of localized response and collective claims? And I think that is, it is both our, it is a popular and scholarly tendency to conceptualize in that way. And so um, there are ways that it has its uses and there are ways that it can be a problem. And so how do we negotiate those tendencies in which then, you know, you can get full on attacks and like, you know, that, you know, in terms of, that's really often about authenticity debates um, in terms of trying to categorize what it means for people to respond in ways that are constructed as a non-Black normative. I can add quickly, I, when I was revisiting um, your article on, on Black ACA fans in preparation for this, um, something that started clicking for me is the way that like, it's almost like a marker of like the posture of, of the Black fan in this moment or the Black ACA fan in this moment is to like refuse those like the, the critical postures we've been trained into or those like gut string reactions to like oh it just came out you know what I'm gonna do tear it apart like I feel like and of course this isn't across the board but there's just something 
like a wheel turning in my head that's like, oh, there's something fanish about the decision to savor something on my own time, to like <laughs> to email Gail about it as opposed to <laughs> Googling it. You know, like I, there's something protective about my, like, or something that I'm working through around my desire to protect my space of consumption, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. and let it be whatever it is before I engage the critical zeitgeist that feels like it makes, it feels like indicative of being a fan. Yeah, I mean, I, and I do think that that's sort of inherent to a lot of people who study popular culture about how to protect what we love in relation to critique. But I also think with, I, I do sometimes wonder, um, it's an extension of sort of like our critical practice of there's in in as scholars and grad students that it sort of tendency to tear things apart, but there is a kind of cultural and inherent anti fandom maybe in black consumption that black folks are often very likely to watch things they know they will hate and to hate watch and conceptualize it. You know, like there's a kind of that they will watch and then like incessantly discuss the thing that is bad, like how something is bad. Um, and there's, so there's something, there's kind of a, a very specific Black version of anti-fandom I've been trying to struggle with and think about. Um, maybe that's not true, but I, I feel like there's a piece of that, right? Um, because I feel like I see it a lot. It's like, you know, you're not going to watch this. So why are you watching this? And then they watch it and then they watch the next thing, right? So I think there's, there's some piece of that um, as a part of, as a historical cultural practice. Um, which might be just about like sort of consuming um, mainstream white <laughs> cultural production sort of in general, that the practice of to watch things now is like to focus on exclusions when we know that that is what it will always be, right? I think too, like for me, sometimes it's like a form of building community. I don't, maybe not forming, building a community, but it's like, I know I'm not going to like it, but if I can talk to somebody else who doesn't like it, then, you know, having the conversation makes me feel like, okay, well, you know, it justifies why I'm watching it. And so mm -hmm. or, or it gives me uh, a reason to, to engage with it, even though I know already going in, I'm, I'm not going to like this, but something also keeps me in it. So mm -hmm. I, I think about like, what keeps me watching it, even though I know <laughs> I, I'm not liking this or I don't like it. Um, so yeah, I don't know, maybe it's, you know, some community building that happens, you know, when we watch it and, and talk with others about it. Hold on, here's my question though. Are okay. the lines between like and dislike so distinct? That's my, and the reason why, what's that Neil Long Omar Epps movie that we were talking about? Oh, oh it was the stalker and there's- The stalker minutes. movie, right. Okay, so part of our joy, do you, does anybody really like this movie? Does anyone like, but also, do you really have enough like energy around it to hate it, or do you get pleasure by being somewhere in between? Like, I think part of this conversation also feels like it's about like redefining our terms for our affinity or engagement with these texts. It's yeah. Is is Raquel watching this? Because I feel like she. I would say that a lot of people relate to reality TV that way. Not everybody, but there's some forms of reality TV that people relate to in that way. And Raquel is here. And um, <laughs> if you want to come over to panelists, I think that'd be great right now. I, I love this. I love this importance <laughs> of Zoom. Like you could just call people in. No, I just say it's like, it's like, it's like my Donna friends. So Raquel, like help me answer that question. <laughs> Black Kina Dalla friend. Hey, can you answer that question? <laughs> but I do think that I think that I mean it's interesting. There is pleasure, but I mean again, this is we have this in fan studies. We know that there's pleasure in the hate watch. We know that there's pleasure in the anti fandom. We know there's there's certain pleasures of in in that. Like there are different there are different ranges of pleasures that we're thinking about. I feel like there are a number of things in the Q and A. So and it's like a quarter after. So Gail, so I don't know if we should. Yeah, I agree. Let's turn to the Q&A. But if, if Raquel shows up, I want her to answer that question. Okay. So oh. Raquel, you're here. Hey. <laughs> hi, I'm here. I'm not turning on my camera because I'm like in my pajamas, but hi. <laughs> Raquel, do you want to jump in on these questions of different affective positions? 
how they relate to how hate watching relates to community building um the you know the thin line between love and hate anything like that I mean, I, I think I'll try to save whatever I have to say mainly for, so I have something to talk about on, on my panel um, with, with folks. Um, but but I, I, I mean, I, I liked what Rebecca said earlier about people needing different spaces. And I think that part of what we're doing is we are creating um, a lot of really kind of hard rigid lines around spaces when I think black cinephilia and black fandom has always been about um, traversing those and kind of blurring blurring those lines I think as the as the panelists are really um well pointing out and I think it's slippery I think that um you know I actually I don't know that I fully believe in the I, I don't know that I fully believe in the concept of hate watching but that's a whole other a whole other thing because I think that you have to have some kind of in you have to have some kind of emotional toehold in order to continue to watch a thing um mm -hmm. as like a form of motivation but um, but I just think that speaks to the slipperiness. But I, I don't really want to take up the time. But since I was called out or called in, I wanted to <laughs> say, hi, Gail. I wanted to say something. <laughs> Thank you, Raquel. And uh, everyone, you can hear more from Raquel Gates uh, in two weeks on our Fandom and Race panel. OK, great. <laughs> that was a great trailer for you, Raquel. Um, all right, let's, all right, I'll just say really quickly, one idea that has occurred to me throughout this conversation is maybe BIPOC audiences and um, LGBTQ audiences and women and femme audiences have like double or even triple reception. Um, whereas a lot of white and male and heteronormative audience members only have like single reception. And I would say, um, you know, minoritized triple reception is like, we know what we think of it. We know what other members of our community thinks of it. And we know what the dominant audience members, you know, the white audience and the male audience think of the thing, you know, like we just know what those, what those different modes of reception are. And I think a lot of conflict I see in fan spaces are around white audience members or male audience members or heteronormative audience members, just not knowing there are multiple modes of reception, just sort of like not being aware of how different communities receive that text. So there's something about just the knowingness of like when you say you hate the thing and when you say you like the thing or that you're fine with the thing, you know, it just depends on like navigating different, you know, different fanish spaces, different reception spaces too. Um, and, yeah. And that's, that's interesting because I think of fan spaces as as inherently conflictual, right? Like that the Jew, there are always camps and fandom that are split around reception and but those and then what is often denied is those splits are identity based so like they know that that fans know that their splits around reception but they won't necessarily acknowledge some of it like so we know that there is just misogyny specifically in the structure of how women characters are treated in shows like in a, and you know across the board in certain conceptual ways from breaking bad to supernatural to whatever i mean there's just this long history of like how like the love interest like ends up being treated um in shows right and then so there's a refusal then to see misogyny or sort of the gender logics of fandom as as informing that treatment um as well as just queer readings and other kinds of readings so i um and then you just end up, I mean, you just feel like with Supernatural, I, I just think the people who really felt like Endgame was Destiel, like Dean and Castiel, like they like they would just like come to blow, like if they were like face to face, they would have like hit people over the finale, right? Like it wasn't um, as if something was just so obvious. And that is, that's probably the pleasure, but just like some of the like excessiveness of fan culture, like, this is obvious the outcome. This is obvious what it's supposed to be when it's not. Like it's it's just it's it is their production. They're just their reading practices in terms of how people you know develop their love for the show and what their desires ended up being in relation to the show or the the film or whatever. And then and then it's naturalized. And then when identity hits that, that's when it becomes so so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah yeah yeah. Okay, great. Let's turn to the audience. Mark Stewart asks, hi, Mark. 
I don't know what time it is in New Zealand, but I think it's okay maybe. I think it's an okay time. Uh, what does it mean affectively when Lindelof describes Watchmen as an expensive bit of fanfic? Are there ways that he is trying to circumvent certain challenges with that? Should we challenge the appropriation of fan fiction by professional creators? The appropriation of fan fiction by professional creators. I do want Rebecca to answer any of these questions she feels like answering, but I also would like uh, Malika and Patrick and Grace to you know, jump in when you feel like you have a response too. Well, and I have someone saying, someone's answering this question live, but so I don't know what that meant some someone, but um, I, yeah. So, I mean, the interesting thing about saying that something's corporate fan fiction, like the, the, um, the directionality of who makes that claim is kind of interesting. So um, Linda Hoff said that, but there've been other things that have been called fan fiction. Some things are accused of being fan fiction, right? Um, so um, I think it just depends on like how we understand sort of what fan fiction is doing, right? I mean, I think that just structurally um, in terms of how it works narratively and conceptually and the kind of work it does, it's very consistent with fan fiction. And that when we let go of, which is easier and easier to do given the increased monetization and people sort of finding ways to profit with changes to fan fiction, that I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of less and less um, believing of, um, the non-economic aspect of something being fan fiction is just foundational to what it is. I just, you know, I think that that is, um, it's historically been about what has made it possible. And I think it's still continually what makes it possible. Like, so, I mean, that's important. And that he had the rights to do it um, because of, a, um, of this model. Um, but I don't think that there's, I don't know what he's trying to, is he trying, what challenges is he trying to circumvent? Legal ones? Well, he doesn't have any legal ones. Like he, they, like DC, uh, Warner Bros, they have the, they have the right to the material legally because of that contract. The moral rights he has, he tried over and over to go get to more and Moore's like, I don't want anything to do with you. Gibbons likes it. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's, I mean, I think it probably hurts him that he just, he really wants more. I suspect he really wants more to watch it and to like it. And I think that's just never going to happen. Um, so yes, that may be what he's trying to circumvent is, is, is Moore's um, disapproval of the project. Um, so that's true, but I don't know. But again, I don't, I don't know if there's like a, a clear line to me conceptually in something, if it was a nonprofit stuff that something nonprofit that showed up online um, in what it means, do you know what I'm saying? I, I think that yeah. conceptually it's doing something. I have a, I have a, a I love that interpretation of Lindelof's position. I have a slightly different one, um, which is, I believe, I'm not going to find this reference right now, but I believe in an interview around Prometheus, which is, you know, an alien sequel, uh, which Lindelof wrote, that he said it was fan fiction and it's his privilege to have his fan fiction made into, you know, a multi-million dollar movie, that kind of thing. And I actually think he is, he is the most successful fanfic writer, you know, he gets to have his fan fiction be produced by studios with big name actors and he gets paid a hefty salary and there's beautiful production values around his fan fiction. And, and he's so, and in a way I like that because so many um, creators and just audience members and, you know, Twitter users use fan fiction as a synonym for the bad, for like the culturally <laughs> illegitimate and like, that's just bad fan fiction. And sometimes they're like, that's just fan fiction. Like that alone designates the thing as bad. And Lindelof doesn't use it that way. He uses it as like a real legitimate um, category, a genre that he writes in. And I appreciate that about, about the way he uses that word fan fiction. But you know, like just how privileged he is as a fan fiction writer just astounds me. And I think that his privilege as a fan fiction writer is what every fan fiction writer would love, I mean, not every, but a lot of fan fiction writers would love for the creator of the source material to say, we love your fanfic and I've read it and it's great. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. like Damon Lindelof being like, oh man, more never watched Watchmen. He like never returned my calls, you know? And it's like, wow, that's a privileged fan. When he's like, gosh, darn it. 
Alan Moore never actually called me back about my fanfic. <laughs> like really mostly fanfic writers don't get that call. And I think that's okay. Um, but when you're that privileged a fanfic writer, you know, there's that element where you're like, I kind of expect me to call me back. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's have this question from um, about the FX series Atlanta, which I wonder if that's ever going to I can't really, I don't think I can answer that one. I have, I have to catch up on Atlanta to think about it. I, I oh. have 10 thoughts, but I just, I'm still behind. So, alas. All right, we'll just say, <laughs> let's ask anybody, do you think Atlanta's coming back? Um, Glover just signed that deal with Netflix. Is it coming back? For what I heard, it is. Um, the last I heard, it was late 2021. But, you know, um, so that's the last I, I heard. But, you know, that, that could easily change as we see with lots of things taking place now, so. <laughs> but if it's late 2021, it's been shot. Like it's been, it's right. in post or something. Right. So it's um, kind of sitting there. <laughs> All the cast of Atlanta are now like award nominated actors. <laughs> I don't know how they're gonna do, you know, Zazie Beats and Lakeith Stanfield, I feel like I see every week in something new. So I don't know how they're gonna, okay. Um, Raquel asked a question. We already called you in Raquel. So I'm gonna see, I'm gonna turn to other people's questions but I hope we can come back to yours. Uh, John Turner asks, I would love to hear panel discussion of the move away from appropriation. Um, as a model of thinking about how we think about the differently manifesting injuries of history. Does Lot's love slash theft dichotomy fully supplant it? That's interesting. Y'all can read the question in the Q&A too, in the Q&A box. Yeah, because I'm, yeah, I'm thinking really hard about that. So <laughs> okay. the move away, so that's what, so you basically my move away <laughs> from, from thinking about um, appropriation as a model for how we think about the use, the injuries of and the sort of the uses of history. So um, does love and theft entirely supplant it? I don't think so. Um, I think love and theft is a particular kind of, um, I think a lot of, like these are things are related, but I mean, again, very different. I mean, because part of the injury of minstrelsy is, it is the construction of parameters of what so maybe this is related. It's constructions of parameters of what history means. So, I mean, we can understand bad versions of history. So let's say, let's take Mississippi burning, right? So it was like a canonical example of like white saviorism, sort of putting it into civil rights history, et cetera, as, as a kind of phantasmagoric, you know, uh, construction of um, histories of black trauma to serve whiteness. Um, and sort of white freedom narrative. So, I mean, there's a relationship there. Um, and so that kind of, um, and so what we understand that context. I mean, part of why I'm trying to move away from appropriation is that I do wanna make spaces for all of us to engage in thoughtful, educate, educated, citational ways um, with history that, um, including histories that are not our own and histories that are our own, um, his histories that inevitably interact um, in ways that appropriation can't really get at what it means when we feel like someone's doing something that's not what we would tell or what we would do, but also still leaving room to sort of take to, take to task um, versions of history that are clearly um, doing something or saying something to the groups of people that are being interacted with. I mean, I, I feel like they, they weren't saying when I thought was interesting about Watchmen, it wasn't the case that telling their story was necessarily saying something horrible about their family or the people in Tulsa wasn't doing that. It was just that it was their story in their place, right? Which it does, it does haunt me. That's a line that I just I keep thinking about it. It's, it's a really haunting one. Um, you know, and it made me think like, well, someone should find a way for their story to be told. Someone who wants to tell that story should do it, right? Um, and so make create create the conditions for to allow other stories to be told about Tulsa. Um, and it was just interesting that we had such a, a we had in a in within a year two different things telling a story about about Tulsa. 
Uh, well, no, but there was that other film. That was other film that came out, I think, right? That small film about Tulsa. What was that? Um, I'm forgetting. Um, so, I mean, I do think it doesn't supplant it, but it's one of the many ways, I think what I'm, I guess I'm thinking of is that there are many ways and we can think about the kinds of injuries that happen when we tell stories about history and they are real and how do we categorize them and how do we construct a more ethical relationship to narrativizing it? I mean, when you talk about ethics, you know, in a fan ethics, and I'm gonna ask a fan ethics question in a second, I hear this negotiation between, you know, as some of the interlocutors just said about like a personal relationship to the text and a communal or collective relationship to the text. And it seems like one thing the internet has done is it has sort of like forced us to at least acknowledge there is social reception, you know, there is such a thing as the collective opinion. And so we have to reckon with that, even as Malika says, even if sometimes the reckoning is sort of a refusal and a sort of, you know, hiding away from the social. But something about ethics suggests a consensus that like we have we have to be working out and working through. Um, yes, span spaces are spaces of conflict, but you know, like there mustn't there also it, I mean, I think part of what you're advocating for is like at some point it'd be good to have a consensus though about mm -hmm. fan ethics, you know, and not just like forever remain in this time of the internet's history when we're just literally fighting all the time because there's no agreed upon ground uh, mm -hmm. for these debates or something, you know? Does that make sense? Am I just like talking? A, a quick baby addition <laughs> to this. It's so good, like everything else. Um, what's something I heard raised in a conversation that was about the, um, the star show P Valley, um, which was written by Katori Hall. Yes, it's everything. Um, but when somebody on this panel was talking about how they they felt like there were some missed opportunities to depict the queer social world of one of the main characters, Uncle Clifford. And then um, somebody on the panel, Dr. I pulled up the name, Julian Kivon Glover was basically reminding us that like recent turns in black trans studies have actually pivoted away from an emphasis on representation as the domain where we establish ethics. And I, I'm really curious about this question and desire for a, a consensus of fan ethics because I feel the impulse. And I'm wondering like, what if it's instead of trying to level that with representation, we, we do the work in the spaces we're variously placed um to to alter whatever kinds of common senses we're altering <laughs> as speakers thinkers organizers artists or maybe artists is a bad example but i guess i'm just wondering if it's what if we stop relying on representation to do that leveling for us and instead understood that to be micro work that will then change the way we read media but not like always being super invested in the media doing it right because i think especially explicitly in this circumstance with the representation of a black gender nonconforming femme it's like we know that the world is not made for that person to thrive like the whole world let alone the micro world of the stars show um so i'm curious about like how do we not and i'm and following dr glover i'm curious about how do we not um, project onto the representation this big hearty work of actually leveling the the material conditions of the world. Um, and that's not, yeah, that's, that's all. <laughs> I have so much thoughts that aren't really complete sentences, but that's like the feeling I wanted to sprinkle in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I almost wonder if that's the work though, right? Like it is ultimately in that conversation we're talking about the ways that a text becomes black or becomes what, like however we may think about it as being, are all the ways that the folks add what, are they, what they're looking, what, what they're bringing to the table. And is that, do I need the text to do all of this work? Is the kind of, uh, can the text do all of that work? And on some levels, would the text actually be really bad if it did all of that work? Like, would it actually, would it at a certain point in time stop being an enjoyable text? Or the fact that it uh, doesn't always have those things in the text allows for a variety of different ports for entry 
And then also for other folks to add, and, and on some level, we are also seeing what's behind, what's underneath the iceberg. And so I think there's also that, that part of like the fan experience is really important because I don't always need, I don't say no, if I want the text to do everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I call that under determination, um, which comes from a colleague of mine, Kamiko Ryokai, who found that she's a designer, an HCI designer, and she found that when she didn't name the green splotch on the interactive play mat, just left it unnamed, then every child that played with the play mat named it. They named it their own thing. They named it a pond, or they named it a dinosaur footprint, or they named it mountains that were represented as flat because it's a flat play mat um and you need that amount of underdetermination i think for you know what umberto echo would call the open work uh you need that openness i mean he would say every work is an open work but it's like a work that's more open than others you know invites in that play and that engagement and that participation um, and that completing, you know, as any as a good post structuralist would say, like we complete the text. The text is not complete or sufficient in in and unto itself, um, mm-hmm. is my perspective on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, Xavier Publius, I hope I'm saying that somewhat correctly, asks, what strategies would you recommend for navigating the irreconcilability irreconcilability of these ethical claims in specific situations? Is there a heuristic? for addressing competing injury claims in fan spaces. So now we're almost getting to a legal, you know, a sort of idea of adjudication. Um, Rebecca, I think this is, you've got to speak to this first. Well, I mean, there was, there was, I don't know if you saw it, like in the chat, someone said, this is a problem. We don't have a social contract in fan studies. So Linda, it was uh, Linda Howell, right? Um, that I think, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I have, and, and, and I think in your question, it's embedded in specific situations. So there are a lot of situations. So which situations are we talking about? I mean, I do think a situ- situational practice matters. I do think, um, but I do, and you know, trying to work, again, I was like trying to sort of work through the hypotheticals in the situation about, you um, representation and injury. There was something that went on over the summer about um, like this Nazi fan fiction or something. And there were these sort of fights around that. And I was thinking about um, some of those debates. And then I went back and looked at this, um, you know, some of these, um, some earlier cases and kerfuffles. And I, um, you know, I just, you know, I'm just not sure. I mean, I'm actually trying to sit here and think about, I'm trying to think about that. I'm trying to think about what it would mean maybe for to sort of come up through up with a certain kind of set of ethical practices that people would agree upon. And it probably would differ in terms of communities. It would differ in terms of, um, maybe it would differ in terms of subject matter. I don't know, but I mean, that is really what I've been trying to sort of just start to figure out, you know, I don't know. Do you have any ideas? (laughs) Does anybody else? I want to hear from panelists or from interlocutors, but I also just note over the past, um, you know, 20 years, how fan ethics have changed, like in, let's just say with the real person fic, Um, you know, in the earlier internet communities, RPF was just completely, you know, not always banned, but like consistently frowned upon and often banned, more often banned than not. It would sort of be like the only rule almost was like nothing about real people. Like we're not gonna write real people together. We're not gonna ship real people together, you know? And especially things like we're not gonna claim that that straight actor or that that actor who identifies publicly as heterosexual uh, is in a same sex relationship with his co-star or something like that, you know? Like that was just too, too far, a line that couldn't be crossed. And and I, and now that's just not the case. Like RPF and RPS is just all over the place. So I think there's an, another interesting element, which is like, fan, even the fan ethics that fans used to really agree upon, uh, strong consensus, nobody barely questioned those things, you know, changed and evolved as the, as the internet um, aged, uh, and as fan discussions, you know, just multiplied. So I think there's something about, I know this is what, you know, the law says it tries to do. It tries to like 
have some pedestals and some foundations and also change with the times, um, be responsive. Um, but I don't know that I, I feel like fan negotiations have not often happened in a legalistic forum or even according to legalistic thinking. And so I don't know, I'm a I find myself wondering if that even can happen or even if it should happen, mm -hmm. um, that we should start sort of thinking like a court like these are court cases and let's like let's look at precedents and let's ask ourselves like what the you know bright line tests are that we're applying here or you know I mean and who decides like I don't know but I yeah but I like what you're saying Rebecca about situational practice matters that feels real <laughs> that feels like yep that's something we have to acknowledge um all right Black exploitation. There's a question about that. Um, a resurgence in black exploitation and uh, a resurgence of interest among non-black audiences, uh, including other BIPOC groups. Any thoughts about that? Let's think we about examples. What are some? Tarantino did that. Um, anybody else have answers? <laughs> but that's that's I'm gonna put that well, in. I, I wonder, like, where, like, was there ever a like when? In the black exploitation era, I'm not under the impression that those were only popular amongst black people. Like I feel like um, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that there was always already um, cultural buy-in from other uh, groups of differently marginalized audiences, which is why, or which is part of why the images have been so enduring. I think about Tarantino. I also think about the awkward remakes and also the parodies. I think another part of that is things like Black Dynamite, Undercover Brother, these like comedic parodies of Black exploitation um, that kind of like sell to the Adult Swim Cartoon Network <laughs> genre of human um, that I also belong to, but how that brings in another group of people who then go searching. Even the, um, the I, I'm sure there's renewed interest in like Rudy Ray Moore from the Eddie Murphy uh, film that Netflix just did. So I think it's, I think it's curious. I'm, I am like an unapologetic black exploitation fan. <laughs> so I'm like, sure, let's watch them and think about them and listen to the soundtracks. Yeah, I do agree with Malika. I, I don't think there was ever a time where like people were not interested in it who were, you know, non-Black. Um, and I think there's, we've just come up with creative ways of having the conversation again or presenting um, the material again. So, you know, now we can even think about how it's it's become animated, literally. Like you can see, you know, like, I don't know if we want to call Mike Tyson's thing black exploitation, but I feel like that kind of can veer off in that direction. So, you know, where we now have cartoons that are, are doing this. So I think the resurgence may be a resurgence of different platforms and mediums discussing the topic, but not necessarily like new interest that's coming in. It's just more so like a new delivery um, mm -hmm. of the content now. Yeah, I think exploitation film is one of my favorite things to think about just in the history of cinema and media. It's just, um, you know, fascinating um, development of a genre. But for sure, Malaika, like, you know, I think when Bruce Lee returned to Hong Kong, what he was really thinking about was black exploitation. He was like, um, I, he was like, you know, I teach black students in Oakland and I understand what these films, how these films are related to a civil rights struggle and to just kind of an ordinary experience of everyday life, but like putting them in alternate registers and very heightened registers. And he sort of like presented that framework of extremist, you know, spectacle to Hong Kong, to the Hong Kong film industry and made it work. It like exploitation is almost like a style. It's like a way of doing that travels very well. Like Tarantino is able to enter into that space without too much trouble and without too much like mucking around with the, with the basics or something. Um, so yeah, I think there's that exploitation, not as like a specific, I mean, there is a specific moment in history when it flares up and is formulated and the research gets done, but it also like, just keeps traveling and traveling and traveling um, in time and space. 
Yeah. Could we also say that maybe there's it's a re uh, introduction to, to new audiences. So like if I think mm -hmm. about my students now, like my students aren't familiar with black exploitation from like the 70s. They're they're probably familiar with you know Eddie Murphy's you know um, um, why is it blanking on me? Uh, his you know his interpretation of it. So maybe it's not necessarily a resurgence, but in introducing to people to audiences who were not there or not familiar with it at all. So it's kind of like this brand new uh, feature that they get to take part in. Well, does get into questions of piracy too, though, and the fact that. You can find some of the more, um, shall we say, independent black exploitation films on YouTube. Like some of the ones that you would have had to know somebody who knew somebody who had a copy of a copy uh, 10, 15 years ago. And so just a portal uh, and things that don't make it to Netflix, right? And so I think there's something to be said about the black exploitation as an aesthetic that is part of what we're seeing in the current moment. Because I'm thinking about Joanna Demmer's work and talking about the idea of sampling the 70s. And like, that's how I'm particularly familiar with it as a as the fascination that 90s hip hop had for black exploitation. And so if there is a pocket of uh, kind of just popular culture, even the, on the internet that has any kind of fascination with 90s, 2000 era pop culture, then you're also gonna follow that particular kind of rabbit hole and you're gonna get into like black exploitation in the film of that era. I think there's also this way that the film gets conflated with a certain kind of politics of the era that if we are in this kind of protest space, that I think might also be a reason why folks might revisit these films uh, in the current moment. Uh, so with those things combined, I think ends up being one of the reasons why I could see there being some kind of resonance for black exploitation in the current moment. It's just interesting that as y'all were flagging though, is that what you're seeing it is in it is manifesting in these different uh, modalities, which would be as you were talking about comic books and and also cartoons. Which for me, the reappropriation and that my familiarity was always through music, which is like okay, it's the way that Snoop is appropriating Max Julian, you know, in a, a music video, or the ways that so and so is sampling all of these James Brown soundtracks, and so I think that. Those are, that might be part of what we're seeing in the current moment, but I would be interested in just seeing how it, it's being taken up by these communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also think there's a DIY ethos, as you're saying, the more independent black exploitation productions that also resonates with this moment. You know, the Eddie Murphy Dolomite film is really a making of Dolomite. I, I mean, like Dolomite kind of like, we kind of get these, you know, images from the film, but it's really about a kind of very um, self sort of like, um, you know, TikTok star, <laughs> sort of like, if you can, if you can find some cameras and you can get some people that know lighting, um, you don't have to be anybody. You don't have to be trained. You don't have to have money. Um, you know, you need a kind of community willingness and a kind of lust for fame. And, um, you know, like you, we all are artists. Like everybody can be a maker and make something really interesting almost in its like lack of professionalism, right? It's like a punk kind of ethos too. So I think like that attitude that feeds into black exploitation in the 70s is something that people are responding to right now in the age of just like social media making and um, low cost, you know, stardom and that kind of thing. Um, okay, we are almost at the end of our time. I feel like, you know, we could go in any direction at this point. <laughs> um, the Jenny Keegan question, because I'm actually yeah. curious what people think about this. Um, right. I love that. Jenny Keegan asks, you talked about the specificity of place-based trauma with the response of residents of Tulsa to the history of the Tulsa massacre. And I wonder if you can speak to how ownership of stories changes over time. The Tulsa massacre occurred in 1921. Traumas like the Atlanta child killer or Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and Mississippi are much more recent. How do you feel the moral ownership of historical trauma shifts over time, if at all? And what responsibility do creators have in that regard? So yeah, I mean, and I wanted to ask because I actually don't know except a few things. I mean, I do think it does matter when people are still alive. Like I do think there is something about um, about like living 
people who were interacting or had these experiences. But I mean, I guess the interesting thing about something like Katrina, even the Atlanta child murders, I mean, you, these are what's so important in thinking about these traumas that yes, they're, they're very local traumas that were experienced by specific people and local communities, but how many of us heard this? I mean, growing, I mean, I remember growing up in the age of the Atlanta child murders and what it meant for me um, and, and like what, how black parents would talk to you about like what was happening, you know, like, I mean, it was, it was, or like when I first started to have this sense, like it was a pretty young child that, you know, that ch black children were being murdered in the eighties, right? Like, and so it's, it's, um, there's a way in which these things are collective, right? And I, um, and, and like trying to balance out your responsibility to this. I mean, part of it's like if you use real people's names, but then there's the absence. There's also an injury where you don't use real people, right? So, I mean, I do think, I mean, I've, I've been interested in, in watching El Damon Lindolf has gone back to, like he's giving some, you know, just a little money, not that much money, but some money to, to, to um, in Tulsa and he's supporting things. He, you know, he wore, you know, this, this t-shirt he won for the awards or whatever. Like I'm interested in sort of practices where people say like, okay, I'm gonna engage with the community at least. I'm gonna have an ethical relation to the community and doing things. And I think that that is part of the ethical practice um, in terms of, your moral responsibility to stories and history and traumas like in the wake, right? Um, you know, what does it mean to be telling stories about the dead and the living? Um, and so we, it's, it's about your relationship to the communities in some kind of ethical way, right? Um, yeah. And I think I was gonna say the question of time is also interesting for me to me because I know like with Tulsa they're like we're coming up on a big anniversary like there's just like a renewed and active cultural investment in the story of the Greenwood Massacre in Tulsa right now and I think around anniversaries we do see like a resurgence of investment and in discourse about who owns the rights to the story. And that's not to say that people aren't asking those questions before, but definitely right around or before. Um, like I know like Tulsa has these big art projects where they're bringing residents in by the by like large cohorts of artists in around this history. And like, it's just such a, it's a, it's loaded there. Same way with Katrina, like I'm currently in New Orleans and then, um, and not even in not even just the event of Katrina, but because of disaster capitalism's impact on New Orleans, there's active tension always about cultural production ownership, who's getting media attention and paid. Like the artist Dred Scott just did this massive um, uh, community-based performance enactment that was so like like such a loaded thing people hated it people loved it people hated those who participated like it was such a uh what's I'm trying to find a metaphor but it like it shook things up and people are still recovering right so I think there's a way that like spaces that have experienced trauma people who have experienced trauma hold a like a type of hyper vigilance that's like e that's even like psychologically sound right like we know that that's something that happens to the to the traumatized body um, but I am curious about like the ways that that enters these public conversations about culture and money. Because um, something that I'm curious about also is the fact that it's folks aren't always invested in the economic payout of a certain situation until somebody else gets a bunch of money off of it. And that doesn't always happen, but that's often been the case in like this contemporary moment, especially with like TikTok and Instagram trims, like I've written about hashtag on fleek and how like there's this initial moment of just conversation, like intramural sociality, content sharing, fun, laughter, validation. And then the moment that thing is held by capitalism, then we get to the rehearsed conversation about theft and property and all those things. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that speaks to, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the whole anniversary thing, because I feel like many of these communities, you know, let's just think, you know, Tulsa in particular, you know, that they've been having these um, 
celebrations and these, you know, uh, telling of the stories anyway, before it kind of made this public history, before it became this, you know, public history on display. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like, you know, once a movie or a TV show highlights it in a certain way, then there's like an additional added attention that is there, mm -hmm. that has always, always been there, but now it's like, it's, it's even extra. And I think it kind of speaks to that point of like, once some money is, is involved, you know, now we're like, oh, well, well what are we gonna, what, what can, how can I benefit from this? When there were already things happening, people were already, you know, acknowledging and, and, and celebrating, but now that it gets kind of like a, another level of notoriety, you know, it shifts, that the shift hap, the shift, excuse me, happens. Um, that I, I think that's kind of been asked in the question there. All right, we're in our last three minutes. Um, Patrick, Rebecca, any concluding thoughts for tonight? No. <laughs> I mean, I you know I'm I'm grateful for having the opportunity and um, uh, to sort of start to work through these ideas. Um, my goal is just not to you know embarrass myself with this new work. So I'm just grateful for you for giving me the opportunity to sort of like try some things out. I love this work, this new work. I feel like I'm gonna start citing it like today, like tomorrow, you know? So I'm just, until it's published, I'm just gonna have to like send quotes back to you to make sure their the quotes are okay, but it's ready to go. I am ready to, to engage with this work uh, this second and have, and have been doing for a couple hours. So great. Thank you so much, Rebecca, Grace, Patrick, Malaika, and everybody who came tonight. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but I feel like we had such a rich discussion. I really uh, benefited from everything that everybody said and brought up and in chat. Um, thank you. Thank you. Please come to Kavita Phillips' keynote lecture on piracy next Thursday. Uh, the Thursday after that, the Fandom and Race Scholars Panel, and the Thursday after that, the Piracy and Capitalism Scholars Panel. So please come to our next three events. Thank you for coming tonight. Have a great night, everybody.